So um, today, in today's meeting, this is just a, a workshop for those who are maybe having some trouble, or maybe even aren't sure whether or not you're having some trouble, you're just maybe a little bit curious, about how to tune up your argument analysis assignments. Final argument analysis is due uh, later this week, yeah, Wednesday at midnight. Um, so we want to make sure that like, we're doing this well. You're to choose from one of the argument analyses that you've already done or pick a brand new topic. If you are planning on picking a brand new topic and you haven't cleared it with me yet, you need to do that as soon as possible. We're starting to get into territory where like, I'm not comfortable clearing something this, this late in the game. Um, so either something new, in which case you have cleared it or you're about to clear it with me, um, or one of the topics that we've already addressed. The idea there is not to curtail your freedom unnecessarily, it's to curtail your freedom necessarily. It's to curtail your freedom in such a way that you don't get yourself into trouble trying to write an argument analysis on some topic that's just too unfocused, yeah, too unwieldy to actually do some sort of like kind of sensible reduction down into like the basic arguments that are at play. So for example, if, if the question was something like, uh, I don't know, do long distance relationships work or something like that? And it's just like, good golly, that's like a huge, big, broad question. It's really, really difficult to focus. You're going to get yourself into trouble if you try to write an argument analysis on that. It's possible to do it, but it's a tightrope walk, and I'd, I'd just as soon not set you up for failure. So we have some pretty focused questions already. If you have another one, let me know. And there's like a lot of leeway in some, some of these argument analyses, drafts that we've already seen, like the news you can use one, where there's like a whole bunch of different places you can run with it. So uh, there still should be plenty of freedom there. One thing that I want to address like before we get into the workshopping, and the workshopping is going to work more or less like this, I'm going to take some volunteers from the audience here, folks who are kind of like, I've got something work that I'm working on here. We're going to take a look at your argument. We're going to try to workshop it and get it a little bit tighter and better. Hopefully, we want, we want all of the arguments that we look at to be the best available arguments for the conclusions that they're coming to. And that means uh, maybe taking them out, putting them on the table, letting everybody mess around with them to see if we can make them stronger, see if we can figure out ways in which they're weak. Before we get into that, I want to make sure that everybody's aware of the structure of this assignment. The instructions are pretty clear in the format that they're asking you to follow. Some of that format is there so that I can grade the assignments quickly, so that like everybody's looks the same and I'm not spending a whole lot of time looking for like, wait, where are they talking about X? Where are we talking about Y? The other thing is that I'm actually using this format to get you to do the things that this course is about, namely, offer a construction of an argument that reveals its structure, that reveals like what is actually going on in the argument, and then discussing analytically what the strengths and weaknesses of that style of argument are, and how it is that this particular argument responds to the, you know, the possible pitfalls and the strengths and weaknesses of that style of argument. All of that's before you even get into like, that prose paragraph version of it. So make sure that we're doing this. Notice that like, the format of this assignment is like first, Give me an intro, and that intro should be, tell me, like, what's the question? Yeah. What's the question that you're trying to answer? And if you can't answer that, like, I find a lot of times people will want to write a paper where they have something to say, but it's not clear that what they have to say is an answer to a question. They just got, like, some, they're looking to vent their soul somehow. They, got, they just feel this urge to soapbox. Resist that. If you're going to like, ask somebody to read through what you have to say, figure out first, like, what's the question that's being asked? And is it an interesting question? Not just what is the question, but like, why should your reader care? And if you're having trouble answering those two questions, you kind of probably need to go back to the drawing board and get a little more focused about what it is that you're trying to do. So that's the first part. The second and third parts are... The kind of like argument one and argument two parts. And then the fourth part is, yeah, which is the better argument? One or two? And why? Which means we're going to need a third argument, an argument about which argument is better than the other one. Arguments one and arguments two are where I think a lot of people are also falling down on the formatting aspect of this assignment. So each of these arguments needs to get blown up into three parts. The first part is what we've been calling a skeletal sketch. 
And I want this to be bare bones. This is one of the like, more difficult things that we're going to be working on today. We're going to try to figure out how do we shuttle back and forth between what I'm sure is the easier version for, this, uh, uh, for you to write on this, which is the, the prose elaboration. My sense is that this is how like, most of you have mm-hmm. learned how to write. You have some idea. You've thought about it for a little while. You sit down at your keyboard. You just start typing. Do you pre-write? Yeah, some folks do. Do you outline? One of the things that we're doing here is we're, we're getting your arguments into such a structure so that I'm forcing you to do a little pre-writing. And maybe even not just pre-writing, because when you think of pre-writing in that sense, it's something that you do before you write, and then you write, and then you're done. Maybe you have some revisions where you'll go back and you'll rewrite what you wrote. But do you not go back to the pre-writing again? Because the pre-writing is your, that's your, your blueprint, right? That's where all the organizational work is going on. And it certainly seems to make sense to me that when I'm doing revisions, I want to revisit that skeletal sketch. So one of the things that we're going to be doing today is shuttling back and forth between these kinds of vague intuitions that you have about the argument that you're trying to make that you would put in a first draft of a prose elaboration. We're going to try to see if we can focus that a little more to get a a better skeletal sketch. And then there's this section in the middle, which is argument type identification and analysis where you're telling me, this skeletal sketch that you just made, like, what kind of argument is that? We've discussed a wide variety of kinds of arguments. Identify it for me, and then tell me, like, what is it that makes that style of argument good? What is it that makes that style of argument bad? And now you've got a blueprint already kind of worked out for, like, whether or not the argument that you make is good or bad, because you've already set the criteria for what's a good version of this type of argument. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so you're going to do that for argument one, you're going to do that for argument two, And then in part four, don't need any skeletal sketches, don't need any argument type identification or analysis. All that's going on down here is a prose paragraph or two or three. Let's try to keep it to one if you can. This is not meant to be a paper. This is meant to kind of be a very rough but very highly highly organized version of like a pre-writing for a paper. This is a very, this is kind of, not even a first draft of a paper. It's the work that I would expect you to do in order to write a good first draft of a paper. All right, so you're going to do that for argument one, argument two, and then a third argument that tells me which of those two arguments is better and why. Maggie, you've had your hand up for a while, very patiently. What is it that you have to say? I, I'm afraid I'm committing the fallacy of giving the argument you believe the most time talking or the most light. Yeah, you're having trouble seeing it from the other side and, and kind of no, charitably I representing? I see it from the other side. It's just I feel like I'm writing about the side I want you to believe more. And Do you need to be writing more in order to make your argument? I sometimes get this from folks that they're like, this argument's better because it's longer. No, yeah, right? That makes no sense. You maybe don't need to, it might be the thing that you want to say more about. This kind of maybe gets back to what I was saying before yeah. about soapboxing rather than question answering, mm-hmm. question asking and answering. But like, yeah, you might just have a whole bunch of stuff that you want to say, but ask yourself if you are, you could have two different things going on, maybe both of these two things. One of the things is that, let's say it's argument one that you have a very long account for. Maybe you just have a whole bunch of stuff that you're trying to say in this that doesn't actually answer your question. Yeah. It's just other somewhat related stuff that you have on your mind that you want to kind of get off your chest and write it down and let everybody know what you think. Mm-hmm. Just answer the question. You don't, yeah. need to, you don't need to kind of like explore all of the tangential ideas. The other thing that could be going on is it's not so much that argument one is artificially long because you are losing focus on how to answer your question could be that argument two is just not being elaborated on as much as it should. So you have a difference between argument one and argument two. Maybe that means argument two, for the sake of balance at least, if not fairness. Argument two maybe needs to be a little bit longer. Maybe argument one needs to be a little bit shorter. You should probably be thinking about both of those. Yeah, Hagen. The point of this is to find the truth. And if you believe that you found the truth, then you want to reveal it to your reader such that they would look at your reasons and be like, those are good reasons. Is that persuasion? Perhaps. We know that one of the reasons why I might be kind of like itchy about this is that 
In order for persuasion to happen, all that needs to occur is for somebody to change their mind. And a good argument is neither necessary nor sufficient for persuasion. People can be persuaded by bad arguments. People can fail to be persuaded by good arguments. All it takes is sticking your fingers in your ears. So maybe if we can kind of tease apart this question of whether or not your audience is actually persuaded. Because if that's your goal, if your goal is to persuade your audience, then is it by any means necessary? Use dirty tricks if possible. I will pop you for that if you do that, right? If you're using dirty tricks, I'm not going to say dirty trick. I'm going to say sloppy reasoning. There's a, there's a fallacy that's gone on here. So one way of thinking about this rather than trying to persuade your audience is you're trying to work through it yourself. You're trying to convince yourself of what the correct answer is. And you're not going in with any preconceptions if possible, if you can kind of adopt this mindset of suspending belief until you're done making and looking at the arguments. So you, yeah, instead of trying to persuade your reader, maybe try to figure out for yourself. And do it in such a way that it's organized so that you can kind of show it to somebody else. And it's not just like a big mess, right? That's rude to your reader. I'm your reader, by the way. Don't be rude to your reader when they hold your grade in their hand. Give me something organized. Give me something that's going to be easy to follow. Something that's not going to make my face angry while I grade. Yeah. Yeah. So I can introduce my question and find if they feel like it's interesting. Yeah. Um, is that going to, um, should I still use that as an approach for this final one? Yeah, not only are you going to help figure out like why this topic might be interesting to people or maybe whether it's, whether it's interesting or not to people. Um, and you should maybe have questions about your sample size as well. Ten people at a bar maybe isn't necessarily your audience. No, so, yeah. Persuade, yeah. But the other, thing that, yeah, the other thing that you can get in kind of asking strangers or friends or family about this sort of stuff is most people won't be like, oh, that's an interesting question. Most people will say, like, that's an interesting question, and here's what I think about it. And they'll give you free arguments. They might, they might be worth exactly what they cost. So, like, beware, they might not actually be very good arguments. But then again, they might be good arguments. And it'll give you, like, a way to think about, like, how do people tend to think about argument one? How do people tend to think about argument two? And as I mentioned before, what we're looking for here is the best available argument for the conclusions at stake. And we might have to kind of artificially focus on one rather than another in order to make that a simple affair. Yes? That's one of the things that we're going to hopefully talk about today. Just, there's no way that that got picked up by the microphone, so I'm going to repeat it for the sake of the people at home. Um, <clears throat> the question was, uh, let me see if I can reconstruct it. Uh, is you, I believe what you were saying was you found that, especially in the prose elaboration part of your argument perhaps, you had argument threads that didn't show up in your skeletal sketch and that maybe weren't part of, they, they were tangential to the argument that you were making. Ah. Okay, yeah, you want these to match. Maybe there were things that you mentioned in your introduction that don't make an appearance anywhere else. Probably they shouldn't be in the introduction then. Yep. Which probably just means like you wrote the introduction, then you wrote the arguments, and then you found like, ah, I didn't find a way to shoehorn in the thing that I said in the introduction. But probably just as well, go back, rewrite the introduction. Have you heard this before as a writing strategy? Your introduction should probably be the last thing that you write. Go ahead and jot down a draft of it, but like be ready to sacrifice it. You might very well, this kind of goes to what we were saying before, you might end up changing your mind along the way. You want to remain open to that. Okay. There are more, if there are no further questions that are just kind of about like, broad structure, maybe we can start workshopping somebody's argument. This is where I take a brave volunteer to go first, and the reward for 
being so brave and going first is you get direct feedback on the work that you're doing. Yeah, Jim? Yeah. Let's start with what question are you asking? Permissible? Presumably anywhere? Presumably. Yeah. Maybe we will limit this to the United States. If we need to make a distinction there, that's going to be a, the most interesting thing for your audience, which so far as you and me and all the rest of the folks here, most of whom are fairly concerned about like what the legal status of capital punishment is, here in the United States, maybe North Carolina if we want to narrow it. Maybe we decide that this is a state issue rather than a federal issue. But either way, maybe the real question that we're asking is like, if you and I were to build a brand new society from scratch, what would we have to say about capital punishment? Should it be permissible? Should it not? Okay. Two arguments. Argument one. Argument two. Do you have a sense of which way you're leaning? Uh, yeah. Which way are you leaning? You're leaning towards, you were leaning towards yes. Are you still leaning towards yes? Not, I'm, not, I'm straightening a little bit, but based on the class argument. And okay. Thanks, Dillard, and Dillard, and Dillard, and Dillard, and Dillard, and Dillard. People at Jake's, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you workshop this with other people, and they give you some reasons to perhaps think no. But you started out leaning towards yes, and you seem to maybe still be leaning towards yes, but less confidently? Less, well, not less confidently, less uh, persuaded. It's always just yes, never heard any arguments for the other side. Okay. That were compelling. So, okay, so you're a little more on the fence than you were before, or definitely. or you're still firmly a yes, but like you get the no side yes, now. Definitely. Okay. All right. Um, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the thing you already know, or do you want to start with the thing that you're less sure about? The less sure. Let's start with that. All right. What do you suppose are the best arguments for no on capital punishment? And before we move forward, everybody see how tidy that was? Question, is capital punishment permissible? How many possible answers? Yes, no. You have two sides. Elegant, right? Now you only have to worry about argument one, argument two. You don't have to worry about like, well, maybe there's some third position that's neither yes nor no, or both yes nor no. Like, hmm, neither one of those seems to be sensible positions. Maybe we can open this up if people want to talk more about it. But it looks like a nice, tidy, focused question at least insofar as it can be broken into two possible answers, a yes answer and a no answer. So let's start with what Jimmy was saying about uh, the no argument. Not that we, that's the conclusion. What are the reasons for believing that conclusion? The, the uh, rehabilitation. Uh, I, like the, I like that part of um, the earth to be the sun and those lives. Or a rehabilitation, like, as a model for punishment? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, this all by itself, not even a premise yet, right? It's not even a statement. It doesn't have a truth value. Rehabilitation as a model for punishment. Can we make it into a statement, at least? Yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't be too difficult. How would you... Just tweak this sentence fragment into something that like could be true or false. One of my classmates back here made a very good statement for this argument. Okay. Um, today, but yeah. Do you remember what it was? It, 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 um, it, it, it just leaned towards the side, well, you're not giving that person a chance when we should be more Okay, so instead of rehabilitation as a model for punishment, maybe we want to say something like rehabilitation, rehabilitation is a good model for punishment. We might even say something like if a punishment is just, then it must be rehabilitative. Or we can even soften that a little bit. Must aim at, let's not demand that it be successful, 
After all, the person just might be a bad seed and they're not interested in changing. But it must at least aim at rehabilitation. Now, I'm not sure like, how 100% like, confident I am that this is true, but this seems like a nice if-then statement to build an argument off of. And notice, we started out with just kind of like a vague idea. So, uh, rehabilitation. There's something about rehabilitation. Let's get very clear about what we're saying about rehabilitation. Perhaps we want to say that if a punishment is just, it must aim at rehabilitation. And from here, we might say something like, how are we going to start from here and make an argument that gets to no capital punishment is not permissible? Yeah, Higgin. Well, we haven't gone beyond one premise yet. Let's see, let's see if we can actually get from this premise to the conclusion. If punishment is just, then it must aim at rehabilitation. Can we say something like capital punishment does not aim at rehabilitation? Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're, we're jumping ahead, like okay. one thing at a time. Like one se- First, let's turn this sentiment into a sentence. And then let's turn that sentence into an argument. And then we'll step back and look. Like, is that argument any good? Can we make it stronger? Capital punishment is not rehabilitative. Can't even aim at it, right? If a punishment is just, then it must aim at rehabilitation. Capital punishment does not aim at rehabilitation. Therefore, Therefore, capital punishment is not just. And maybe we need to supply an additional premise here that says if it's not just, it shouldn't be permissible. We shouldn't permit injustice. Certainly not by the state, at least. Right? Maybe not by anybody. Maybe this is part of what justice means. It's not permissible to do what is not just. What kind of argument is this? Mm, close, not modus ponens. This is modus tollens because it's, it's if P then uh, if P then Q. And then notice capital punishment is not rehabilitative. It does not aim at re- rehabilitation. So we're actually saying not Q, therefore not P. That's modus tollens. Now we've got the like, argument identification and analysis part to it as well. Like What else can we say about a modus tollens argument? Are they good? Depends, uh, actually, right? It, like, they're valid, at least. Modus tollens arguments are valid, which is to say, if their premises are true, then their conclusion would have to be true. But that means that the weak spot in the modus tollens argument is the truth of the premises, right? We can question whether or not that one's true. We can question whether or not that one's true. Does one of them seem more questionable than the other? Here's your chance, Hagen. Yeah, which one seems more questionable? The first one, if a punishment is just, then it must aim at rehabilitation. Maybe this is like when we get to analyzing the strength of this argument, we're going to say its weakest spot is premise one. This is where perhaps this is like a, a, a lead on where the battle lines between yes, the, the yes and no con, uh, conclusions might end up occurring. Right? It's this question about like, how do I feel about this premise? And we can certainly take some time to get into why we might doubt this premise. We might want to try to find a stronger argument. But in the meantime, do we get a sense of how we've done the skeletal sketch now, right? Bullet-pointed premise and conclusion. Only two premises, one conclusion. That's as simple as you get for arguments. We've revealed the basic structure behind what's going on. In your prose paragraph, Jimmy, you might go into more detail. You might back up why we think this is true. You might back up why we think this is true. You might supply that additional premise that gets us from capital punishment is not just to therefore it's not permissible. All of these little kind of like gap fillers and window dressings and rhetorical flourishes and all that stuff. Go ahead and do that. If you need to cite sources, that's where you're going to do it. You're going to do it in that prose paragraph. But in the skeletal sketch, I just want some sense of what the architecture of your argument is like, what its structure looks like, what kind of arguments you're really deploying here at the end of the day. Ultimately, what's going on at the heart of this effort to persuade and then what, what is it that makes that sort of argument good? What are its weak spots? And let's attend to the weak spots. 
So we got some sense of what the no argument might be like. Let's jump over to the yes argument for a second and see if maybe then we can get into this process of like, let's tune up. Maybe that's not the best argument we can get. Maybe there are better versions of this. Maybe that won't be the best one. Maybe we'll decide that those are the best ones and we can move on to that last phase of like which one's the better argument and why. So Jimmy, can we come back to you? Why yes? Every rule breaker implicitly accepts the punishment. They might not sign a document that says, I hereby accept the punishment in murdering this person of like a capital crime. Yeah. I'm yeah. I mean, they're coming out for you and okay, I want to kill them. I, I have to wait till they get out of Texas and get to uh uh well this would be out of all of them. A state without the death penalty? Yeah. So I gotta wait I gotta catch them when they get there. That way I know if I kill them, at least I'm gonna get a life. Yeah. Hey, I'm kind of curious about this. We I wrote this premise like you were kind of talking about it in with respect to like killing people in particularly gruesome and unrepentant ways and capital punishment being the punishment. Does this work for our, all rules? If you break the rule, you implicitly accepted the punishment? No. No? If you're breaking an unjust law, if you're doing it knowingly and lovingly, if you're doing it in the way that, like, I don't know, folks like Dr. King talk about with, with uh, nonviolent direct action, yeah, you do knowingly accept. Like, I... I sat at that lunch counter implicitly accepting that I might get arrested in doing so. And I don't, and I don't squawk too much when I do get arrested. What if you don't know the punishment? Well, yeah, so this is what if you don't know the punishment. What if you don't think about the connection between the punishment and the crime when you're committing the crime? Yeah. We might think of all kinds of analogies. Run and stop signs, speeding on the highway. Does every person who breaks the law implicitly accept the punishment? What if you don't know the punishment? Well, it's been said there's legal precedent to suggest that like ignorance of the law is no defense. But it certainly might kind of chip away at this idea that I implicitly accept the punishment whenever I break the, the whenever I break a rule. So I might have some questions about whether or not this is true. I think I've got bigger questions, which is like, how do I get from here to yes, therefore capital punishment is permissible? I get a vague sense that this is somehow related to this conclusion, but I can't see the path just yet. At least not as clear as I can see this path. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that because you don't agree with the main No, no. Well, maybe. Maybe that's maybe it's because I don't agree with the premise. But let's try to not let that get in my way. I'm trying to like, shake off the... All right. Be, be objective about this, Adam. Don't let your bias kind of cloud your judgment. Maybe this is true, but how do I get from this to my conclusion? Let's, maybe this is premise one, like we, were, like we did before. We started with... A sentiment, we turned it into a statement, and then that was a premise that we could build off of to make an argument. Is this a premise that I can build off of to make an argument? Mm -hmm. What does the rest of the argument look like? Uh, you know, capital punishment, the, the, the law of what you get if you break a rule, or a certain rule, Capital punishment is the punishment for breaking certain rules. Yes. Therefore, every person who breaks those certain rules implicitly accepts the punishment. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the punishment is therefore permissible? Any punishment that somebody accepts must be permissible? Yes. Yes? This, Jimmy's this like, say argument. yes. You say yes. It's your argument. This is our argument. Well, yeah, it is hard. This is, you have to overcome your bias in order to see it that way, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but this is what the exercise is all about, right? This is where we're trying to like, get the best version of this that we can. Um, 
How do we feel? Because in order to get from here to therefore capital punishment is permissible, we need to say something about any punishment that somebody accepts is automatically permissible. How do you feel about that? I don't think you accept the death penalty. We could, we could like, talk to like, everybody who's on death row and say, like, do you accept the death penalty? And they might say, like, no. And we say, like, yeah, but you implicitly accepted it whenever, like, when you committed the crime. And they're like, well, but I don't explicitly accept it right now. So, like, what's your point? But that's, that's after the fact. I, I, I want to hear what Hayes Yeah. There might also be, I have questions about, like, thought experiments about, like, what if somebody was innocent of a crime, but they accepted yeah. the punishment that was handed down? And we say, like, if you accept it, then it's permissible for you to have it. Should we say something like, it's permissible to execute an innocent person for a crime that they didn't commit so long as they accept it? No, that's not permissible. It's, that might be a barrier to like getting from here to yes on, uh, as an answer to the question. Hagen, what do you have? I was going to say that it would be more easy. I feel it would be easier to say instead of every rule breaker implicitly accepting the death penalty, that the death penalty. How do you feel about that, Jimmy? Can we, can we change our first premise? No, all guilty people deserve their punishment. Yeah, maybe you don't accept it, but you definitely, if you break a rule, you deserve the punishment. I can't say implicitly accept the punishment. No, you can say, you can, it's your argument analysis. You can say whatever you want. We just have a question about, like, it seems like it might be difficult to get from here to your yes conclusion. But implicitly makes it easier. Yeah, we can, well, we can, we have two paths before us right now, at least two paths. Two that come to mind readily. One is we can stick with this as a first premise and try to soldier on and make an argument from it. The other one is we can say, like, this first premise was close, but maybe not exactly what we want to say. And we can spin it a little bit to see if we can have an easier argument to make. What, what, what's your intuition on this, Jimmy? Do we want to stick with this and soldier on, or do we want to kind of say, like, I'm, I'm not, I haven't turned this in yet, so I'm not married to this as a first premise, let's go ahead and change it. They implicit, all guilty people implicitly accept every guilty person. Only guilty people implicitly accept a punishment? Maybe they explicitly? What's going on with this implicitly thing? Yeah? I mean, I said implicitly because not every guilty person, like, officially declares their acceptance of their punishment. Many of them explicitly say that I don't think that I should be punished. And maybe they do so because they disagree about whether or not they're guilty. Or they'll say something like, look, I'm guilty of something. I definitely killed those people. But it but wasn't a capital crime. Perhaps I'm, yeah, I'm insane. I was mad with passion at the time, or I'm mad most of the time because I have a mental illness, or something like that. Yeah, these are... Well, so I killed all those people you had, all those women had on high heels, so I killed them. Can't yeah, but I still need to be punished. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Only guilty and all guilty people? Only and all guilty people? Or all and only guilty people deserve punishment? What's your second premise then? All and only, by the way, have we seen this phrase? What does all and only do? It's an, it's an if P then Q and if Q then P. If you're guilty, you deserve punishment. And if you deserve punishment, you must be guilty. Mm-hmm. It's known as a biconditional. We didn't really work through that as an operator. But if you take philosophy 310, you totally will. Yeah. All and only guilty people deserve punishment. And then what's the next thing? Uh, all guilty, all and only guilty people deserve punishment. Punishment should fit the crime. By fit, you mean proportional to? Severity of the punishment should be proportional to the severity of the crime committed. Which is, a shorthand version of this would be the punishment should fit the crime. Mm-hmm. All and only gets the people who deserve punishment. Punishment should fit the crime. So all and only, I can get to another conclusion from here. All and only guilty people deserve a punishment that fits their crime. Am I too yes on capital punishment yet? Well, let's, let's, if we did it before, we can do it again. That's the cool thing about arguments. They don't go stale. They're as good today as they were yesterday. Yep. Um, of course, this, this is my argument analysis, but I definitely want to help everybody else. Oh, you are. Is he? Yeah, just the process of starting from these kind of like vague intuitions and recognizing that like, I don't really have an argument just yet. Maybe I need to tinker with my premises, but yeah. You don't even think these are true. Really? They seem pretty uncontroversial to me. Which of them seems most suspicious to you? Well, you should take a punishment that is proportional to the severity of the crime. Yeah. That's proportional to the severity of the crime. And maybe speeding while your wife is in labor is a crime, but it's not a particularly severe one, so we shouldn't execute you for it. We maybe shouldn't even fine you the same way that we would fine somebody who is speeding just because, uh, I don't know, because they didn't want to miss the beginning of their favorite show. Eh, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, a shake of the finger. and Eh, hey, don't do that again. Or maybe we would say something like, it's actually not a crime yeah. to speed while your wife's in eh, Maybe not. Maybe this comes back to your kind of implicit acceptance, maybe even explicit acceptance. If my wife is in labor and I have to speed to get her to the hospital on time and I get fined for it, I'm going to be like, whatever. Give me the fine. I'll pay it. Totally worth it to me. I understood what I was getting into and I did it knowing that if I got caught, I, should, I would have to pay a fine and I'm okay with it. So yeah, maybe. Aside from that, one of the ways that we might test this is to say, like, can I think of some guilty people who don't deserve punishment? Can I think of some people who deserve punishment who aren't guilty people? And if I can, then that statement is not strictly speaking true. I don't even know if I need this statement to be this strong. I might be able to get away with all guilty people deserve... I'm, I don't even know... I don't, I'm not sure if I need the only part. I think I only need the all part. What about the punishment should fit the crime? Who argues with this? But the berries are bodied in this question of like what counts as fit, and Hagen says it's per, it's the severity of the punishment is proportional to severity of the crime. That's still like there's a whole lot of, of hashing out to do there, right? Like most of our debates are going to be like, is this proportional, right? Does that punishment fit the crime? Does the punishment of execution fit any crime? No. No. 
So this is like, we're, now we're, we're kind of back. This is the question, right? We're back to the big question. What is it doing for society if you take person out of the world, it's not going to fix the problem? Maybe it's not about fixing the problem. Maybe it's about proportional punishment. Maybe this is, maybe what we've got is some sort of like, at bottom, some sort of retributive notion of just punishment going on here when we say that the punishment should fit the crime, which is to say, if you killed people, that is a severe crime. Something comparable in severity should happen to you now. Is, is this a deterrent? No. Well, hold, this, now we have this question of like, we're, we're taking a completely different tack if we go with deterrence, right? If we say that like, the reason why capital punishment is permissible is because it's deterrent, and then we're saying something like, if a punishment deters future crime, then it's permissible? Yeah, maybe. Maybe I can get on board with that. And then we'll say something like, yeah, capital punishment deters future crimes. And then we would say, therefore, it's permissible, right? Uh, pretty straightforward modus ponens. The question would be, does capital punishment deter future crimes? And my sense is that the available data on this is no. somewhere between inconclusive and no. No, uh, no you've got data that says different? Those states are, are less, got less money. No, state shooting the death penalty do not have lower homicide rates than the death penalty of not the state shooting the death penalty. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. So we have one set of sources that says they do, that the, that the death penalty is a deterrent. Another set of sources that say no. What's our, what's our quest? Now we just go like, hey, you got sources, I got sources. I guess we just agree to disagree. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. No, bullshit. Who are your sources? Yeah, so now I got biased. Yeah, who are your sources? Do you have, the, do you have their identity? Uh, yeah. See if you can find them. Pagan, who are your sources? Amnesty International? Not entirely bi Whoa, hold on. Bias is not licensed to dismiss. Bias is caused to be a little bit more critical in trying to figure out if they've gone wrong. It's, and the Washington Post. My guess is probably reporting on the same statistics that Amnesty International is reporting on. Where did those statistics come from? Where were they collected? Are they reliable? All right, th this is the digging you would have to do. If it came down to this question of deterrence, Dartmouth, Dartmouth? Dart Dartmouth. Yeah, yeah. the entire university just like produced these, uh, perhaps a sociologist, a criminologist at Dartmouth, some scholar, just professor a professor of mathematics. Is a professor, professor of mathematics an expert in this? No. Well, they're an expert in statistics in the analysis of statistics, perhaps not an expert in the collection of the data. Did they collect the data, in which case do we have cause to like, be suspicious of whether or not this data is trustworthy? Did they get the data from somebody else who is an expert, like the FBI or something like that? Public Health Service. Public health service. Is that trustworthy? So we'll, we're tracing it back, right? What's gonna, this, the quality of this argument is going to hinge on the truth of this claim if this is the argument that we're going with. It's a nice, pretty straightforward modus ponens argument that's weakest spot is going to be its weakest premise and this appears to be the most controversial premise. And so trying to figure out whether or not this is a good argument is going to come down to this question of, can we trust sources who say yes to this? Can we trust sources who say no to this? And P.S., if the expert community is divided on this question, what's our move? You don't have one. Don't trust anybody. Yeah. Yeah, your move, if like the expert community is genuinely divided on this, and I'm not talking about you can find a few kooks who are kind of just contrarian and are going to say the opposite of what everybody else says. But if it's like 50-50, if there's no clear majority within the, ex within the community of experts on this question, then we should not be taking any particular side on this. We should kind of shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, a premise like this is probably not going to be something that I want to build a case out of because it's too shaky. Yeah. Yeah, he's, oh, he's, he's, his experts. Ball's in your court now, right? Yeah, his is better because he's, he, of course, he's younger. And <laughs> That's not why he's better. <laughs> no, I mean, because I'm Theodore Roosevelt, and it, it, 
Oh, Theodore Roosevelt said that it deters. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. And that, like, yeah, with Roosevelt, we might have a question of expertise. We might have some serious questions of currency as well, right? Roosevelt's not working with, the, Theodore Roosevelt is not working with the freshest of, of data on this. They're not working with anything. Okay, do we get a sense of how this works? These might not be the arguments that we settle with. There is a strong temptation, I'm sure, especially as like you have other things that need to be done for other classes to say like, ah, fuck it, good enough, let's move on. Done. Like, you will not get as many points for bad arguments as you will for better arguments. And believe me when I tell you that I look at like so many different versions of this, and which isn't to say that like I've never heard your argument before, but there's a good chance that I've heard your argument before, and I have a sense of like whether there are better or worse ones, and what the obvious pitfalls are. So maybe we want to kind of abandon it. My sense is, especially if you already have a worked out prose version of this, I bet you can find other arguments that are kind of lurking around behind that. And notice what happened here. We started out with this, well, we started out with something that was kind of like this, about implicitly accepting the punishment. And maybe there's something there, we just didn't figure out how to make it work yet. Then we changed it to something about the desert of punishment, such that it fits the crime, maybe some, some vague articulation of a retributive principle when it comes to just punishment. We didn't finish this argument yet either, but maybe this is the strongest one. Then we jump ship to a completely different argument. My guess is, in your first draft, your prose paragraphs, at the very least, are like this. A whole bunch of different arguments. You throw in like everything that you can against the wall to see what sticks. Don't do that on the final draft. On the final draft, pick one. Pick the strongest one, focus on it, and say, this is my argument. Not like, Here's an argument, here's an argument, here's an argument, here's an argument. Give me one. Focus. Slow down. Tell me what the strongest argument is. I think the one about the, the one that I posted about, about whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich is pretty good. If you want me to do another one, I, I could. Oh, we didn't have to. Like, this one is modus ponens right now. But if we decide that, like, what this really comes down to is this, what we're really basing this on is maybe some kind of enumerative generalization on the basis of data that's been collected. Can I make an inductive generalization about whether or not the, ca uh, whether or not the death penalty deters future crimes? Maybe I'm doing this on the basis of an appeal to expert authority. In which case, really, this argument is an appeal to expert authority. That there's this kind of like broad modus ponens thing going on, but that's not the most interesting part of it. The most interesting part of it is the appeal to authority that's going on in asserting premise two. Does that make sense? It's not a bad move to at least initially be thinking in terms of simple deductive arguments because they're going to help you get a nice clean structure. Maybe it's modus ponens, maybe it's modus tollens, maybe it's disjunctive syllogism. You'll start out with a this or that, and clearly not this, so that's the only available option. And then from there, kind of go on to see if it works. But you don't necessarily have to like, cram it into that box. There are other options available to you as well. Perhaps at our next workshop on Wednesday at 1, which is cutting it all oh, very close to the deadline for this assignment, so like... My expectation is that you wouldn't be coming in with nothing at all. But um, hopefully at, at the next workshop, we can see if we can get an example of somebody who's doing something inductive, and we'll work through, we'll work through it in, a, in, in that sense as well. Particularly, I think, maybe if somebody's doing, the, somebody's doing the vaccine skepticism topic, that seems like it lends itself to all kinds of inductive tools. Yeah. And this isn't, it's not going to fit these kind of argument structures. Well, as it turns out, we have many others, too, right, that are available to you as well. All right. Um, if you have questions still, you can catch me now or on my way back to my office after class. You can email me or you can see me on Wednesday. Hope this was helpful.